that was really great. Thank you, Dr. Taylor. Um, so I'm going to shift a little bit. I'm going to shift it back to you, but I think it was, it's really important that you understand what's going on uh, with the brain tumor patient because it does help you sort of acknowledge what's going on in your life and, and why, as a caregiver for a brain tumor patient, um, you are at a little bit more at risk than other caregivers um, for distress and for things being more challenging. And, and as she mentioned, after the diagnosis of the brain tumor, really those old ways of living um, and doing things together, they may need to give way to new. Um, and that may include you all taking on the role of being a caregiver or a word that's, um, I'm kind of liking now is, is a word called care partner. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about uh, what it means to be a caregiver or a care partner. Um, a care partner or a caregiver is anyone who provides some degree of assistance to a chronically ill person or a disabled person on a regular basis. And that can be really practical things like just going to the appointment, picking up prescriptions. Um, it could be assisting with daily tasks, cooking, cleaning, but it could be monitoring medications, calling the doctor, monitoring symptoms. Usually this person is somebody who's trusted um, and many times it's the main point of contact for our healthcare system, so you're that role. It's often a spouse, um, but as some of you know, it could be an, a, a child, um, or it could be the parent of an adult, um, or a sibling, or even a friend. Um, what I like about care partners um, is that it implies a little bit more of an equal relationship, meaning that together, um, you're working together to uh, take care of the illness. Um, we do know that with a brain injury um, that you, you may sort of move back and forth on this con continuum of care. Certainly after surgery, people need more caregiving. As the illness progresses, they need more caregiving. Um, what we do know historically is that caregiving tends to mean that you put all of your needs aside and focus on the, care, on the patient. Um, but the truth is that that's not sustainable and it's usually not good for your health. And so some people kind of think if we use this term care partner and focus on care partner, it may actually allow us to give a little bit more permission to ourselves to take care of our needs. So it's just a way of uh, thinking about this a little bit differently. I like this slide too because it really does say, and I think you, uh, we've been kind of pointing this out with circles and other things, but when you're a care partner, it acknowledges that there actually are two people that are experiencing this illness. And both people, the patient and the care partner, have new needs as a result of the illness. Um, both people are hoping, hopefully help, trying to help each other uh, with being well, but it also allows both people to keep their interests in perspective. So again, we hope um, to keep things a little bit more balanced. Now, that's a challenge, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about why that is. Um, because all of you in this room know how many hats and how many roles that you carry out. And some of that's our fault as the medical health system. I think things have really changed in the last 20 to 30 years, but we now expect caregivers and care partners to be part of our healthcare team. And the fact is most of you don't have any training on this. Um, and we're expecting you to go home three days after a surgery or as an illness progresses or take some care of someone at the end of their life um, without any training. And I think a lot of people, this is really scary. Um, people feel they don't feel confident about it. Um, and it's, it's just important to recognize that, okay? Um, you are providing care, you're administering medications, you're monitoring symptoms, and, and even that whole piece of knowing who to call for what, and then when is it really okay to call? Should I call about this, should I not? And I think those of you who have been at this for a little while, you do know that this is something that you grow into and you get better at. But certainly at the beginning, it is um, pretty intense. The other thing I think Dr. Taylor touched on a little bit is this whole piece of your role of providing emotional care. So certainly you are um, providing care to the patient, who's your loved one, who both of you have just gone through sort of a catastrophic diagnosis and you're reeling from that. But how about all those other people outside of your circle that are also reeling? Um, it does feel like the caregiver has to be the one who's communicating. And I have heard from caregivers about sort of how this is an unrecognized 
part of what they do is that they end up having to take care of their friends and their family and manage all of their emotions when really they're needing a lot of help themselves. So just acknowledging that, and I think a lot of us, you know, supporting someone emotionally who might be depressed or down doesn't always feel, it feels a little bit scary. We don't know what to do. So just, again, acknowledging that we're learning new skills. There's all the practical things going on. Certainly, you may have to become the house manager. So that can mean everything, cooking, cleaning, dishes, uh, groceries, um, child care, elder care. Um, that can be a big job. A lot of you may have had to become the driver in the family. A lot of people with brain tumors have to either take a break from driving until they get their licenses back, or they can't drive anymore. And so often, the role falls to you. Um, and then finally, this whole part of being an advocate. And this is really something important. You become, in many cases, the spokesperson for the patient. It may be that you're helping them remember what to report to the doctor. You may be the person calling the doctor, setting up the appointments. How about the times when you have to fight with the insurance company to get a prior authorization or get a medicine approved? I bet you've all had to do that. Um, and then the whole piece of advocating for the patient to friends and family. So again, we mentioned a little bit that this disease can sometimes be very invisible. And to the outside world, the patient looks pretty well. And family and friends don't always get it. And you, as the caregiver, have to be sort of protecting your patient and protecting your life and making sure that the right things get done. So you have to advocate on their behalf to friends, family, and the community. So it's a lot. Um, I, I just want to say that this is, besides what we know in our clinic, this is well documented in the literature that um, wearing all of these hats and doing this job is probably one of the hardest things that you'll ever have to do in your life. And I, so we do know that it's hard. And I want you to be sure we need to acknowledge that it's hard and all the feelings that come with it. And that's what I want to just talk about that. Um, I, I like to sort of have people go back for a minute and just think about when they first got diagnosed, when their person first got diagnosed, some of the feelings they felt. And then again, for those who've been in it, if you think about it, these feelings kind of persist. They don't always go away. So common feelings, um, certainly there's shock. There's shock of the diagnosis. It's, it's, I mean, no one can believe it. It's unbelievable, unimaginable. Um, but the truth is, it's often you have that same feeling if and when that tumor comes back. Some people kind of, you move into sort of a, I don't want to say complacency, but you kind of move into a place where you're coping fine, and then when it comes back, you kind of go through this whole feeling of shock again and the reality of the seriousness. I think um, another thing that's really profound is the amount of grief and loss that occurs through this illness. Again, at diagnosis, there's the whole thing about the loss of the person's health, the loss of your future that you had, um, the loss of the life that you planned, and then there's sadness around that, right? Um, the hard thing about this illness is that this continues. Um, there is periods, it ebbs and flows, but I think um, there are often moments that pop up where you realize what you have lost and that things aren't going to be the same, and it, it, it goes on. Then there's the whole concept of fear. So, okay, this is, for many people, we know it's a life-threatening illness, and we know um, that there might not be a cure that we're keeping the, the tumor in check for as long as we can. But a lot of us worry about what's going to happen, how it's going to look. We fear mortality. That's very human. Um, we fear what's going to happen to us as the partner. What's, what's our life going to look like? If we have children, we worry about our kids. Um, what's it going to be like to them? How am I going to manage? So that's a really, that's a normal thing that many people are experiencing, as well as this big common word we hear all the time. It's called uncertainty. But um, the fact is, all that's certain is that our loved one has a brain tumor. Um, we don't know. We do our best as a medical team to treat the patient and treat the illness but we don't know how long it'll last or how long we'll be in this situation. And so sort of living with that, uh, people describe it sort of as that shoe hanging over, waiting for that shoe to drop, but just never knowing when that's going to happen um, can be significant. 
So you have all these feelings. I think they ebb and flow throughout the whole disease trajectory. They're certainly there at diagnosis. Then you might get them kind of in check. And then little things will make them come back up, resurface. It might be that a person has a seizure and that kind of brings it all back. Or um, maybe a new symptom that you worry about. Um, or if the disease comes back. People say this is like being on an emotional roller coaster. I think you would all agree with that. I think all those feelings certainly make you have all these different emotions. Um, I say you could have all of these emotions in one day, but I bet some of you would say you probably could have these in one minute. Um, I want you to know that it's fluid and that this is real. These are normal. This is part. This is part of being a caregiver. So a lot of you probably woke up this morning, you're here. I can do it, I wanna do this. Um, everything, you're feeling kinda good. And then something might happen. You might go back into the bedroom and you might find your loved one who couldn't get their shirt on or your younger child says something like, what's wrong with daddy? And then that just might make you break down into sorrow. It just sort of brings it all up, right? And the truth is that this is a sad situation. Um, and at times, that can become completely overwhelming, either with the sadness or all the things you have to do. Um, that certainly can happen in a day. And then we have these other things that certainly, I think, happen often. Um, you might get really angry, angry, angry. Why is this happening to me? Why is this happening to you? Why is this happening to my kids? Um, or frustrated. Who gets frustrated with their patient? Sometimes when you have said the same thing over like five times and you're a little short on sleep yourself and a little rushed. So you can get frustrated, right? Um, or, and then what happens is we all get guilty. We feel bad. We feel bad because we're angry. We feel guilty that we lost our temper or for putting our needs first, right? And that is what's so important. Okay, so I just, I just want to acknowledge that these are all normal um, and they happen and, and they're okay. Um, what the problem is, is that it makes it hard for us to stay balanced as caregivers. And so um, you'll, try, you'll be balancing all these feelings of uncertainty about your future and then you're adjusting uh, to changes in the relationship. You might have a new partner, you might have a different partner or just a little bit of a change in what you had before. Then you're usually managing different things in your role. You might be taking on usually more things. Um, and then there's this guilt that kind of weighs things down. And it's, it's hard because you can't even admit sometimes that you're having this feeling because you say, well, the person's got that brain tumor. The person's got the disease that's so serious. Why should I be feeling bad? So you don't, have, you don't feel like you can say things. You don't always have people that you can talk to about it. So all of these things, if they l are left unchecked, they add to distress. And just like this scale shows, um, it may threaten your sense of identity and purpose, and it can be hard. Now, what we do know is there is a little bit of a flip side to this. Um, there are times where you might feel good about the care that you provided. Maybe you know, arranging that transportation schedule to get to radiation every day for four weeks or keeping track of a decadron taper, which sometimes can be tricky, or making that decision when you called the doctor and you said, should I, shouldn't I, and you did, and it was 100% the right thing to do, and you did something good for the patient. So um, that can make you feel just like you're accomplishing something, right? Some people, as a result of a catastrophic illness like this, do find a, they, they're, things get stripped away and they do develop a stronger relationship with their loved one um, and they can find a sense of purpose so um, they they feel like this is what they were set out to do so these are things that can happen and as is this whole piece of accomplishment and I want to focus on that because I think these are we can look for our accomplishments and the goal here would maybe be to try to keep ourselves a little bit more in balance than out of balance Okay, but it's a conundrum. It's a, I call it the caregiver conundrum because it, this, these are the facts. There's grief, you're often overloaded, you're dealing with uncertainty, and I do wanna talk about isolation. Um, you're all in this room, which is amazing, and you all have friends, but even when you have all those people at home, um, again, because of this invisible nature of this illness, it is hard for people to understand, and I think no one, no one really knows what you've experienced as far as the loss 
or what you're worried about. And sometimes it's hard to talk about that. And when people are sick, it's hard to get out and um, connect. So I, I do want, that's a big piece of your conundrum that can, all those things that can add up to cause distress, okay? So one of the things that we think, I, 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 we can't take away the distress. That's the truth, okay? But you can try to focus on some of the things that might bring a little bit more fulfillment and keep you in balance. And I know you're looking at me probably thinking meaning and purpose and caregiving. Are you kidding? I mean, I think a lot of people are thinking, well, how could that be, right? Um, but you have to think about it a little bit. And I, I would suggest that you think about your values. So what are your values as a person? What's important? And there were some values on that beginning slide. Um, in what way is your caregiving allowing you to live out your values? And I don't, is there anybody in this room that wants to maybe think about a value that would go with care, that caregiving is allowing you to live? Does anybody want to say any? How about kindness, honor? Anybody else? I'll keep going. Let's raise your hand if you have one. I was thinking about connection, respect. The best I can get was indifference. Indifference? <laughs> Commitment. Commitment, absolutely. Surrender, some of us surrender, or patience. So these could be our values that, when we talked about setting an intention, and if you use those values that are important to you, your caregiving can be a way to live out those values. And on a more serious note, love. Love, absolutely, love. Okay. I think sometimes people sometimes forget how important your role is as a caregiver. Um, and it's easy to get kind of caught in the day-to-day, -day and, and you don't even stop and look at it. But I want you to know that it is one of the most important things that you're doing it, doing. And without you, your patient would not stay well. So don't underestimate for a minute um, your work. Another thing that we can say you can try to focus on a little bit is thinking about some of the positive aspects of caregiving. How has the caregiving affected your life in a positive way? Have there been any, any little things that have been good things that have come out. And sometimes you have to look, but maybe there's a relationship that's gotten better. Do you have an example? Don't sweat the small stuff. Don't sweat the small stuff. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's a great, and that's great. Sometimes though people f have these friendships that come that they had no idea. Someone shows up out of the woodwork and you have a new friendship. Um, some people it really does help crystallize their values, what's important and help, and some people it helps them rethink what their goals are, and, and that kind of goes with don't split the small stuff. So what's really important, it does help you think about that. I would like you to think, take a minute, sometime at the end of the day maybe, but what have you learned today? So again, sort of thinking about your, who you are and your confidence, but truth be told, I bet every week in this role, some, maybe every day, you're learning something new about yourself and the way you can adapt to this and or cope or to be a caregiver. I also want you to know that having neg what we, I, these people call them negative emotions, but we think they are, but they're natural, they're human, um, and they're common. I bet everyone in this room would say those things that we had up there, um, I, and I want you to know that they're acceptable, and we have to get into a place where that's okay. Okay? And as you move forward, it is important to think about how have you overcome challenges in the past. This is a place where you can draw, draw on your strength, how you've overcome adversity in the past. Maybe some of you have thought about what didn't work. Um, I want you to think about what did work, and you can apply that to this situation. What can you use now? So again, I, I, this is always a struggle. This, but the goal, I think what we know now is that you can strengthen some of these side, things on the fulfillment side so that this stays a little bit more balanced and will make the journey a little, a, a little less distressing for you. 
So they call this, so we now know, in the literature, they used to say, oh, caregiving is bad for my health. Oh, I'm going to be sick. That's all true if the distress is out of, um, out of proportion. But if we can focus on some of the positive things, um, it, you may come through a little bit stronger um, on the other side. Okay. And so one of the ways that we know that we can do this certainly is by giving you knowledge, knowledge about the illness. Certainly what we learned from Dr. Taylor about how it impacts our patient. And I think it's important for all of you guys to recognize that there are risks to the role and there are benefits to the role there are um, and how to stay in balance. I want you to think a little bit about if you're feeling distressed, what are the things that you can change? We can't change the diagnosis or that it's here, but you can reframe the way that you look at things a little bit. So just even getting information. I think knowledge is power for sure. Um, so how do you access the resources that are available to you? Focus on what's important. Again, don't sm sweat the small stuff. If there are changes, if like just you're feeling overwhelmed, like work and taking care of the patient and have kids, are there some small changes you can make at home um, so that you'll have a little bit more space for yourself? Are there some small changes you can do, changes at work and changes at home? What can you let go of? What can you delegate? And this is one of my favorite things. I think it really gets lost sometimes is that whole thing about making time for fun. So sometimes the illness can just take over, right? And everything is about the doctor's appointments, you know, making sure someone's not tired and um, monitoring symptoms and medications. And it's really important uh, with your family member, your loved one, to make time for fun. And you have to schedule it. I mean, I think it's okay. Make a date. That's back to that date night thing. But make sure that you build opportunity in for fun. I think it's important that you nurture yourself so that you do have the strength for coping. I call it maximizing coping, but really making sure your physical health is strong. So that's eating right, sleeping right, um, and your emotional health is critical, okay? I, I don't think I can underestimate this piece. This is serious, and it would be normal to feel down or depressed about taking care of someone with a diagnosis of a brain tumor and all that's involved. What we need to make sure is that you're not suffering from a, a, a clinical depression. We can be in a bad mood about it, but for people that are really struggling, it's very important to get this addressed um, because it clouds everything else. It makes it almost impossible uh, to, to move forward um, or, or to provide the care that you need. So I almost recommend just checking in with a mental health professional just to check in, see how you're doing. If you're feeling like you're struggling 100%, I would recommend. And there are many mental health professionals now who provide support to caregivers. who We understand as a profession um, that this is important. So I feel like those two things are critical. Um, I'd like to encourage you to get support and find connection. We're lucky in San Francisco. We have a group of caregivers that meet here once a month. Um, the ABTA has an online group, so you can match with people if you don't live close to anyone. But it could be your family and friends. But just make sure that you're getting outside and you're being able to talk and share, so not isolate yourself. And then finally, one of the things that we know is the importance of resilience, so fostering resilience. And this is, this is big in, in a lot of areas, but certainly for caregivers. Um, we know it's important and that's part of why our program here is today and some of the things that we're going to teach you this afternoon uh, to foster resilience. What we know is that resilience is not an extraordinary trait. Every single person in this room has capacity for it. You probably have it. Um, but it does need to be nurtured. Um, and I think it's important to remember, it doesn't mean you're not, you don't experience distress or bad feelings. You do. But it's your ability to sort of adapt well in the face of adversity, OK? And what we also know is that different, there's not a recipe for this. There, it's not one thing. Um, there are different strategies that work for different people. And so we like to sort of just give you kind of different things that you can try on for yourself. Um, one of the things that I think it's, e this is, we know this, um, it's very, think about this. If someone said something nice about the way you looked or someone mentioned, oh, you're, something looked raggedy, what would you remember? We tend to hold on to kind of the negative stuff and spend a lot of time in our 
had our negative self-talk. So it is important to kind of be thinking, always remembering about the positive things that happen in your day or the way you're looking at things, um, and try to frame your own conversation in your head to be a little bit more positive. I want you to really think about what you're doing well. What are you strong at? I bet every single one of you have strengths in this room, um, but it's re important to remind yourself what are you what's strong? What are you strong at? Instead of thinking what you're not so strong at or what's not going well, just think about it like this. This is sort of a what is it that you need? What do you need to do better? And then I, I just want to remind, so a lot of people are, have resilience because maybe they've been through other hardships before this, but if we get out of balance, if that distress gets too much, um, we can lose our ability to be resilient. So this whole thing about fostering, it's ongoing. We have to keep it up. It's not so hard. And so I'm going to talk about a few things. I'm going to give you a few little things you could practice. Um, and then we have this great afternoon with the exercise person and the self-compassion. Those are other things that can help foster resilience. But these are little things. So positivity. We talked about positive self-talk. But one of the other things that goes in this category is that whole theory of gratitude. Um, so we know that if you spend a little, five minutes, if that, in the evening, thinking about three things that you're grateful for, that we know that fosters resilience. We also know that improves mood. So this is like such an easy thing to do. Um, and it is thinking about things, it might be like that great cup of coffee that you had out there in the cafeteria. No, um, or something, a beautiful walk that you had with a person, uh, or a good song that you had on a radio. But think about concrete things you can feel grateful for every day. Another interesting thing is creativity. So a lot of us get busy, we forget. But if we can nurture that creative side of ourselves, even if you don't feel that you, if you're left brain and not, um, but it could be anything. It could be cooking, it could be gardening, it could be art. Um, but don't give up those moments um, to uh, be creative. Connection is huge. I'm really glad you're here and I hope that you get to know each other and. Um, We'll have our opportunities for our discussion groups. This is so important. Novelty. We know that when you try new things in different ways, that this can foster resilience. And this doesn't have to be anything big. This can be as simple as driving home from UCSF a different way, trying a new route home. And then it could be something really big, like you know something really different that you've never done before. But keeping things novel. They say practice some, try something new every day. Confidence, so this is something you have to think about a little bit, but it is going back to what have you accomplished in that day? Um, what are you doing well? Um, I think it's, it's maybe setting yourself up for small goals and then acknowledging where you've been successful. Or I think, Marty, one time you used tiny victories, but acknowledging that we have tiny victories and then where you've done a good job as a caregiver. But let yourself think about these things, OK? Um, another is connecting with your senses. So this is a little bit more getting in touch with your body. But we know when you're feeling overwhelmed, if you can just take a moment um, to what we call drop into your senses, but think about your five senses. And think of any opportunity you have to use your eyes, smell a good scent, taste something delicious, feel, or hear. And any time you can do all of those things together um, is fantastic. Um, and then the last thing, and we did a little bit of this at the beginning, but this is an exercise that I think is important. It is thinking about how you want to live each day. What's your intention for each day? So there is a practice that you, in the morning, it's one of the things that you do. You think about what characteristic or what trait or what you want to amplify in yourself, and then use that as your guide. Ideally, if you come into a tough situation, you're supposed to remember that. That takes some practice. Um, and then at the end of the day, think about what your intention was. How did you do? It's okay if you did, maybe you did great, maybe you didn't do so great that day. Maybe you didn't think about it. This is what happens to me. I set one and then I don't think about it all day. So just reminding yourself about it and then starting over the next day. But it does make you sort of live intentionally. Okay? 
So those journals we gave you there today could be used for gratitude, intention setting, or grocery lists, whatever you choose. <laughs> so we're really glad you're here. Um, we do hope that you leave here today with some new knowledge and understanding. Um, we hope that you feel safe so that you can get a handle and um, name some of the feelings that you've been having. We hope that you'll take a break, you'll enjoy our meal, you'll get a massage, you'll feel, get a little TLC. I hope our afternoon will give you some um, strategies for health and well-being and how to be compassion, ca compassionate. And um, most importantly, I hope today that you connect with each other. I think that's one of the biggest benefits of this day. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over um, to you guys now. If anybody has any questions for Dr. Taylor or myself or anything, that any discussion, I think we have some time. The driving responsibility can get heavy. Um, we discovered Lyft and Uber, <laughs> and um, she does pretty good with that. Um, it can run kind of expensive when she decides that she wants a dessert, <laughs> and she lifted over to the Maria's Bakery, really good bakery, um, and comes back with a, you know, Tray of them while I'm at work, and so it was nice. I came home and there was plenty of dessert. <laughs> um, it was also thirty dollars for dessert. So, um, yeah, the, the connection of services on the phone and the iPad to credit cards can uh, be a challenge, but um, you know, liberating, right? Like she can go shopping online now, and uh, as opposed to jumping in the car and. And so that, that's been a revolution, the, the, uh, a relief from a good chunk of the driving duties. Um, so I sort of balance that against the fact that I don't need a second car and no insurance for that. And so. Did everybody hear that? You, so try using Uber and Lyft when the driving gets heavy. And the, the question, and I continue to forget to ask this, and so I, it's, it's on my brain. And, um, it's the, um, the role of the, um, the brain in, in controlling breathing. So kind of noticed this almost apnea mm -hmm. in the way, you know, right parietal. Um, my, my Sylvia has the right parietal damage. So I, I just noticed that it's, it's an odd thing where, you know, obviously it's voluntary. So it's... Thoughts? Did everybody hear the question? So the question was sort of helping to localize breathing. Um, um, so that is one of you there. It does sort of localize in the brain, but as is, I've alluded to, there's a lot of connectivity there. Um, there's also other things that can affect apnea, um, particularly if they're with this steroids and, and changes to... Last year I had a, a slide about the steroids and all of the horrible things the steroids can do to the body. Um, and so some of the changes in, in body habitus and weight and things can also have an impact on things like sleep apnea that are just natural structural you know, problems. Um, so I think some of it is knowing how, you know, following and seeing how tired she is during the day. Um, but sleep is really important. So, tr so sometimes a sleep study and things like that can be helpful to try to pinpoint um, where the localization is for the apnea. Um, things like a CPAP machine and stuff can be ch challenging to integrate into anyone's life. <laughs> um, but I even that. notice when she's awake and she's like reading, she has this sort of halting breathing where she, you know, will hold and then release. And, and it's this, it's an interesting, uneven pattern of breathing. So I just, um, you know, she's not on any steroids, and she's not any treatment at this point. And, and so I think, you know, I, I definitely need to ask about this when we're in session with Dr. Clark. But, um, you know, I guess my real question is, is can I expect a continual decline in, you know, because yeah. she's had decline in cognitive uh, abilities and her executive function, 
and you know the impulsivity and the, and, and forgetfulness. And so yeah. I guess I'm wondering, do I start to pay more attention to this? Yeah, I mean, it's a very instinctual thing. I think knowing, again, the localization of her tumor would be helpful. Dr. Clark obviously could kind of walk through that with you, but I certainly would encourage you to speak with her and ask her questions about that. I, I don't, if it's not distressing, I'm not sure I would be overly yeah, concerned it, it about it for her. Seem to yeah. Her. But I do say, just to, you know, to the impulsivity piece um, and the, the access to the internet and shopping and things on the internet can have. A, a negative oh, yeah. um, <laughs> for that impulse control and yeah. I have ha yeah so I so that's really hard because again I mean to, I think for all of us now it's one thing to take away our driving privileges but if you took away my cell phone and that we re you know so um, right my my connection yeah. to the internet that would be that was a very challenging thing I don't I, I don't know that we have this definitely come up a couple of times and um, I think there's a lot of resources we can tap into like the like Parkinson's disease for example that's something that where there's a lot of impulsivity concerns and and so leveraging the work that a lot of our other neuro oncology colleagues have done in a lot of other like traumatic brain injury and trying to just figure out how to put some reasonable um, safety things in place to try to so you're not ending up with Five hundred dollars worth of um, once a week. You know, it's about it's a hard balance. It's a hard balance. Yes. My my son loves to go online and shop. Yeah. Um, we've actually taken all but one credit card away from him, and we leave every two weeks. He's had somewhere between a hundred to two hundred dollars. Oh, so you're just keeping the money. <laughs> and that is it. So he has that one credit card that he knows the numbers too, because you know, his, as we all know, the memory is a his long-term right. memory is great. Right. His short-term right. memory is not. not not there. So he has one credit card. Um, he's been dying because it got hacked. Mm -hmm. So it took us two weeks to get one. Mm -hmm. So it, within the next day or two, I figured it would be maxed out again. Um, so he can go do some shopping. But he has one credit card. He gets about 200 bucks every two weeks on it. And that's what he has to use. A debit. Uh, no, it's a credit card. Okay. It's a credit card. And so just to take them up, like this is why this is one of the really great reasons why you're here today. I mean, learning these trick, you know, these tips, um, it's really very helpful. I mean, that's not something I would have thought about. But you, uh, the safety issue piece of it too, with getting you know information we, out. We hard. canceled all of his cards and got all new ones. Mm -hmm. So because he would re remember the other ones, <laughs> <laughs> but now he don't have those numbers, so he can't put those numbers in. He just has that one card. Yes. Sir. Um, I sometimes feel, or frequently feel, that I'm running on a constant uh, shot of adrenaline. Mm. And I'm just wondering if um, you've come across other caregivers in the room, uh, if people feel that way, that it's a constant, it's like, you know, you're constantly being called to do things and you survive because adrenaline is mm. kicking in. And I'm wondering if that's something that has been brought up or discussed. Who who would feel who feels that? <laughs> I think that's true, right? Um, absolutely true. And I think it it never ends. In the minute you think you're going to get a rest, you get a call. Well, but that's what makes it makes survivability possible. Right. And Kathy. <laughs> and Kevin. But does anyone have a response? Um, do you want to say something? Well, I was going to say, I remember last year, every day I told myself, I just need to get through today. Mm -hmm. To get through the today. And it was like, I, like you're saying, on adrenaline, it was just like, go and just do what you got to do. And I would get through, because my husband had to go to the rehab, and I was running back and forth to the hospital and working and trying to sleep on the chair. Mm -hmm. and I was just, every day I was like, I just got to get through today. We're going to get through this. And I just kept saying that over and over and months were going by. Right. And, sustainable. and then suddenly you just wake up and go, wow, how am I doing this? Like, mm. I suddenly realized, you know, I have to figure out a way to manage this because it's not just getting through the day. I keep telling myself, don't worry about myself. I'm not, you know, I'll worry about diet later. Or I'll worry about exercise later. Or all that's just going to wait. It's all about my husband. Right. And a year later, I've gained all this weight, and you know, 
<laughs> and I'm like, okay, I'm going to start failing here. And I have to start, you know, balancing it a little bit. Yeah. But it's, I still feel like every day is, like you're saying, you just, you find that energy deep down and you just figure out how to get through it. Yeah. And I'll, I'll just say, part of my, I was telling my wife this, I, I don't know, I'm slow, so I realized this the other day after a year and a half. Um, but I was telling her, we feel like we're doing all this stuff, and then I go like, we're not getting any ground. This is not getting any better. Mm. Like, like this is like just like the uh, survival hamster, hamster wheel. to oh. to just like do it again tomorrow. And it's like none of these problems have gone away. I mean, like, 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 typically, like you know, stuff at work. It's like, like you hit this, you get the project done, go on to the next thing. It's right. kind of like there's like progress. Ground it's away. like this is like. Hey. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's like, yeah, it's like, Well, and yet, the, you know, I totally, totally feel that too. But like Margareta hinted, there was this whole discussion that the character was about these small victories. Mm -hmm. And so to try to find those, and then you can actually feel accomplishment no matter how tiny this little, you know, victory they might have. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, Last week, uh, my wife had all of a sudden these like major mobility issues. So I went and got some scrap wood out of my shed and I built a little ramp up to her bed that gets her that much closer to getting into bed. And it's like this huge victory actually, just doing this little thing that now she can walk up there and she can get into and out of bed pretty safely now just by having another three and a half inches closer to where the bed is. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, I, I feel like yeah. there's like no progress, no progress, and all of a sudden, oh look, I actually that's took a couple hours and built this little yeah. ramp, and now yeah. I have this victory that I can, I can look at. And so it's, it's hard to find a little victory sometimes, but when you find one, it's like, woo -hoo. Yeah. Celebrate, right, celebrate yeah. that, yeah. for sure, for sure. Yeah.